transform yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman and CEO Joe Tucci. Wow. <laughs> when you stand up here, you see the size of this audience, the size of this screen, you can't, just one word comes to your mind wow. And another word comes to my mind welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to TMC World. We have a great event scheduled for you here, and we really, really, really appreciate uh, you attending. I'd like to thank our customers uh, for your confidence you exhibit in EMC, the business you do with us, our partners. We couldn't be successful without you, and all my colleagues at EMC from around the world. Thank you, too, for being here and, and doing everything you do every day of the week. I'm really excited about this event, and hopefully you will be, too. Uh, we got, uh, and I'll give you some statistics in a bit, but it's, uh, we got quite an event planned for you and we'll all have some fun. But the focus is on this event is primarily on you, our customers, actually totally on you, our customers. And you might know that the genesis of the EMC squared uh, logo was the four names of our founders. We had a Egan, a Marino, a Connolly, and a Curly. And of course, they did the playoff of Einstein's theory of relativity, and that's how we came up with our name. But back in 2001, when we had to re re transform ourselves for probably one of the first times and rebuild our business after the collapse of the dot com, we changed what EMC meant. And it meant that everyone in EMC makes customer calls to get more, to get closer to you, to get more intimate to you, to find out your, your problems, your needs, and how we can fulfill them better. And this program has worked great. As an outshooter of this program in 2001, we had our first EMC World, which we called EMC Wizards. And at that event, we had 1,381 customers. Today, we have about 10,000 customers. We had 31 sponsors. Today, we have 120 sponsors. There was 128 sessions. There's well over 500 sessions and 5,000 online sessions. So you could see how we've grown over those 12 years. So who was here, uh, by the way, on that first EMC w Wizards Conference? Anybody here? Yeah, stand up. Quite a change, huh? Thank you for being here for 12 years. When I saw this screen yesterday, I got incredibly impressed. And I asked them to go back in the archives, and I said, can you dig up the first slide I used uh, to welcome everyone to, to the Wizards Conference, first TMC World in 2001? And lo and behold, they found it, and this was it. And by the way, you can see it was on February 12th of 2001. And by the way, I said, do me a favor, put that slide up in the exact size screen that we used. There it is. So not only has the conference grown, the screen has grown. Now, what we did here is we inlaid an American football field. I had a lot of pressure from our head of marketing, Jerry Burton, to put a, a proper football field, as he, as he puts it. And he keeps trying to convince me that a football is round, not oblong, and it's perfectly OK to hit it with your head. But anyway, this is an American football field. And you could see just the size of the screen and how things have changed from that original Wizards conference to today. So uh, hopefully that'll give you, we'll live up to that breath in the, in the sessions you have and the interactions you have. And again, uh, I, I believe that we will. Now this kind of guide is the theme. How many, how many of you, be honest now, raise your hand. How many of you, does this guy creep out? Okay, I'm not the only one. I think we should have a contest. Let's do. A, let's have a contest. Whoever comes up with the best name. I mean, got another uh, picture of this guy. Maybe this is a better picture. So we'll have a contest. This is totally unrehearsed, but trust me, we will not be cheap. We will get a good prize. For, so I want everybody to tweet or whatever you do, and let's see if we can get a name for this person. 
All right. So before the conference is over, we'll announce a winner and we'll have a nice surprise for whoever names this individual. But I'm really glad I'm not the only one who creeps out. But I do think, as much as I picked on Jeremy, he's done a phenomenal job, and, it, and this is a great, a, a great theme for the conference. Uh, because transformation is happening all around us uh, on, a, on a global economy front, transformation everywhere. And of course, IT is transforming, and I'll go into that in a second. Businesses are going to transform. And I think one of the challenges we wanted to lay out here for us, and this means all of us, is how do we transform ourselves to be more relevant, to pick up on the opportunities uh, that this new world and this transformation will put forth. So again, I think this is a great theme and we'll go through this. So what I'm going to do here is use a little bit of my age and uh, take you through how much IT is transforming. Now this is an old slide, we used this last year, might have even used it the year before, and it shows that transformation in IT is not new. And I think of a Fortune reporter years ago called this waves of change. You know, from mainframes to mini to PC microprocessors to client server to now IT as a service or cloud computing. And again, as is depicted here, this cloud computing wave, I see and I truly believe, and the only benefit of being as old as I am is you actually lived through all these waves and saw it. And I'm still going. And I, go, I just want to take you a little bit through to show you some of the factors and how everything changes in IT, everything, as you go from wave to wave. So what I did is I simplified this a little bit, and I brought us back to my roots. I started in 1970, actually started as an assembler programmer. Went into, then went into, there's one other in the room. And this is what the, the two others in the room. So anyway, this is what the world looked like. There was about 20 companies that played in the mini and mainframe era, 20, that had a market cap of over a billion dollars. And trust me, a billion dollars was a lot of money back in 1970s and early 80s. A lot of money. So anyway, every one of those companies had their own, the, 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 if you looked at the chipset, they had their own custom LSI chipset. Most of those companies had their own fabs. If you looked at the topology, the architecture, it was all monolithic. Everything kind of came together in one big box. Memory back then was, was measured in thousands of bytes. Right? The network was all proprietary. All right, so those of you that have some digital roots, you had DECnet. Those of you that had some WANG roots, you had WANGnet. IBM had SNA, et cetera. Storage, we were just moving from tape to disk. Bound in pro closer to the application. The data model back then, it just came into vogue, was index sequential. So now using these great disks, I could now use index sequential to go right to the data I wanted which allowed online processing. They came, out with a, they came out with a programming language called COBOL, which mere mortals could program. And again, we had a boom of online processing. And of course, the applications in that wave that were, that were com computerized, as they said in those days, were the financial applications, the general ledger, accounts receivables, payables, billing, et cetera. And then, of course, the cost of these was very high, very high. So let's fast forward, and what I want you to note is how at the time we got the client server, not some of the things changed, everything changed. No longer was every manufacturer making their own chipset. There was fewer chair risk chipsets, right? The technologies had changed in words like clustering, racking, scale up were in vogue. Memories instead of we're now in millions of bytes. The, the storage model was all disk. Database model changed from ISAM to relational database. Language went from COBOL to C, C++, Java. And what were the killer applications, the iconic applications at that age? ERP, CRM, HR applications, supply chain applications. And again, the end user device changed from proprietary terminals to Windows PCs. Right? For years, our standard in, in EMC was every three years, you get a new Windows PC. No matter what you want, that's what you got. Sometimes you got a laptop, sometimes you got a desktop, but that's what it was. And again, the cost went down, became more affordable, and computing expanded beyond our wildest imaginations. 
But as the saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet. So let's fast forward now to where we are now. And say, again, I'll submit to you, everything is changing. The chipsets in cloud technologies are x86, multi-core technology. The topologies now are virtualized scale out. Memory is now measured in terabytes. Networking is now moving to IPv6. Storage, it's disk and flash. The data models, new data models are emerging, and this will happen over the next, you'll see, because these waves are long waves. You'll see over the next ensuing years that data models to things like Hadoop, NoSQL, and others will, will come into vogue and, and, and great use. Languages, we're moving to frameworks like Spring, like Rails, like Nodes.js, like Python, etc. What's the killer app going to be? I'll predict and bet anybody here, and I'll give you some odds, that the killer apps are going to be all around real time, real time predictive analytics. That, those are going to be the killer apps. The, the end user device, we're in a post PC era. Yes, it's PCs. Yes, it's virtual PCs. Yes, it's tablets. Yes, it's smartphones. From, from many different vendors, many different operating systems, whether it be Android, whether it be iOS, whether it be Windows, and others to come. Costs, again, much more affordable. Computing will be much more pervasive. So again, I'm saying, when you look at this, what causes a wave shift? Well, the first thing that causes a wave shift is technology. And you can see now, hopefully, as I gave you three comparisons, you can see that we've had that technology wave shift. And you're going to get unprecedented levels in this cloud wave, IT as a service wave, unprecedented levels of automation and affordability. Unprecedented levels. The other catalyst for change of IT transformation is businesses themselves or governance themselves. In their ever-ending quench for better productivity, more intimacy with customers, better control of their supply chain, and of course, more and more agility. And they need this to happen at a faster and faster pace to stay competitive. So a little bit of how business transformation is, and IT transformations are playing together to create this wave of change. Again, why we picked this, this uh, topic for our, our agenda. So again, welcome everybody to Cloud Hour. We're here, the technology is here, the business mandates are here, and it's gonna be quite a future. And just like all of these wave changes, of those 20 companies I mentioned that started out in the mainframe and mini computer, the only one left is IBM. The others are either gone from existence or those companies have gone to do different things in life other than information technology. On the other side, look at all the, look at all the great companies that were born since that mainframe and mini computer wave. You know, companies like Microsoft, companies like Cisco, companies like EMC. The list goes on and on and on. So tremendous opportunity. So what we need to do, and why I believe this is a great topic for this, for this uh, forum and summit is because we focus ourselves ourselves on how do we transform. Now there's a, there's a big debate going on, well, which cloud model to win? Will it be private clouds or public clouds? I absolutely think it's a silly, silly question. Let's look at what we believe and then I'll give you some data points. We firmly believe, deeply believe, that there will be hundreds of thousands of private clouds and thousands of big companies, and new companies, will stand up public clouds. So it's a world of both, is what we believe. Again, these are some of the companies, and I, and I said some of the companies that we've been partnering with that are standing up public clouds so that you can find a partner you trust and get the best of both worlds, the benefits of a private cloud and the benefits of a public cloud, the power of end not or. Now, when asked by Gartner and IDC what customers are planning, the way you or somebody in your company or government agency has, has answered this question is, yes, 78% have solid plans for a private cloud and 77% have solid plans for a public cloud. Pretty good demonstration that is a world of N or a world of both. Now, we call this world of both hybrid cloud computing. 
where you will dig instances of private clouds. And then, of course, when a peak comes in a load, in one of your workloads, you can then, instead of having to buy more and more equipment on, 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 just for that little peak, you can then use workloads and, and capacity that's been put up in, 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 in public clouds of vendors that you trust. And there's a whole other set of reasons to use them. So again, using this will give you the best cost and the most efficiency. Now, I talked a lot about technology. Let me talk, go back to the business side of this and the business transformation piece. If you think about a business, and this is true for a government agency too, if you think about a business though, what does a business have that is critical and it's a lasting asset of that business? Well, it's got its brand and its reputation, right? Government is more of a reputation, business is more, we talk about it as a brand, which is everything in life. That's how you get respect, that's what customers trust, that's what they deal with. Obviously, it's from a strictly accounting point of view, it's not listed as an asset, but I'll tell you, running a company, the best asset you could possibly have is your talented, dedicated people. So you got people. The way you serve your customers, the way you work so that you're the most efficient you could be, is you, have, you set a whole set of business processes and a set of applications that support those business processes. That's a critical asset of a company. And then, of course, I'll submit that the information that a company has is also a critical asset. And as I said, this works for government or not-for-profits, same thing, words might change. If it's a military, they might substitute brand with mission. People stays the same, they'll have mission, mission processes, they'll have applications to support them, and of course information is critical in, in, that, in that kind of instance. So it really does whole water and it's true no matter where, whether you're in a company, a not-profit, governmental, or, any, or, any, or any, any entity whatsoever. Now let's take a look at the business process and application information and let's start with information. Obviously for years we've been focusing, as, as, as I said in wave two, when the relational database uh, technologies really came into, into, the, into their own, we've, we focused a lot on structured data. But also, we got, what this clearly tells us is we have to focus more than we have been in the past on unstructured data. It's five to seven times larger than a company or entity's structured data, and it's growing three times faster. And of course, you want to use both for business benefit. If it's not going to give you benefit, why do you have it? So the question is, how do I get benefit out of both kinds of data? But that's a small microcosm of the world. That's kind of the world that was addressed in the client-server era. The world we're addressing today has a much bigger piece of data, and that's data that's available publicly or through our partners. And that's, we call that the digital universe. So you have your structured data, you have your unstructured data within your own entity, and then there's this massive, I mean, it would be this big compared to this screen, the amount of data you have in any one of your companies compared to what's available in the digital universe. So the question is, how do I tap into that data Either, either publicly or my partner's data, plus my data, unstructured, plus my data structured, in real time to give me business benefit and competitive edge over any of my competitors. That's the challenge for tomorrow. That is going to, what's going to make the business of tomorrow successful as opposed to the business of yesterday. Exciting world. Opportunity for everyone in this room. Now let's use an example and have a little bit of fun. So. You go back, and I can remember as a young child, you know, even in, back in kindergarten days, I used to sit there. One of the things I used to love to do is sit there, and I'd help my mother clip the coupons out of the Sunday paper to go shopping. And of course, it's still done. This is from a modern paper. I think Starsky. They tell me I'm, I don't know this factually, but I've been told it's a it's a grocery chain on the West Coast. There's people are shaking their heads yes at me. And again, it's, so you still have that method around. But let's look at the digital universe and how we can change things in a shopping experience. So first, let me introduce you to our handsome and capable head of, head of marketing, Jeremy Burton. Jeremy? That was really quick. So I want to share you a day of Jeremy shopping. So Jeremy's a, a modern kind of guy, and he has, as a matter of fact, I'll. I'll declare his favorite device. 
it's anything Apple, and he, has, he loves his iPhone. So actually, when you're carrying your, your smartphone around with you, you're carrying a sensor around with you. And Jerry is a modern kind of guy, so he has opted in. So he's allowing that information that's publicly available or in a partner ecosystem, namely Jeremy's exact location, to be shared with the, with the Star Grocery. That's a fictitious grocery store, I hope. So we've shared that with Star Groceries. And then what they do, knowing Jeremy's British, they, they tweet to Jerry, Jeremy, or they come back with him, Jeremy, telling him, hey, Jeremy, today's British day at Star Groceries, and all the products from the UK are on sale. That excites Jeremy, he goes into the store. As he enters the store, they know exactly where he is, what aisle he is in. From their structured data, they know what Jeremy has bought in the past and what his likes are, and they know that Jerry me, happens to love hobnobs. Now, I personally have no idea what hobnobs are, but Jeremy likes them. Jeremy just shot it up, it's a biscuit. There you go. So rather than have the clipper coupon, they used positioning and information from their own database, publicly public sourced. There, again, Jeremy opted in, and they pushed a coupon to Jeremy right then. Jeremy gets excited, they can be told exactly what